Today I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with Dr. Michael Pivovar. How are you today? I'm doing very well, Tracy. Thank you very much. I know you're in high demand, so we're just going to hit you with the questions we're all dying, dying to ask you. So, number one, this is my personal favorite from our audience. Um, if President Trump calls you and says, how to deal with the COVID-19 virus, what would you recommend for our markets? We'd love your number one piece of advice, please. Sure. So given my background, the number one piece of advice would be keep the financial markets open. The financial markets are playing a critical role in uh, the response to the crisis. Um, they're providing liquidity for people who need cash right now to be able to sell their financial assets and turn it into cash and use it to do things like meet payroll or their mortgage payments or things like that. They're providing opportunities for people who want to step in and, uh, and, and use this as a buying opportunity and to put a floor on the prices right now. And the other thing they're doing is that they're giving both investors and policymakers critical information in terms of price discovery. So it's not only the fact that the overall market averages you know, had, tend to have wild swings. So last week they were very much down. This week they, we've had more of a recovery. Um, but also we're getting very good information about the relative prices of various industries and various uh, firms um, in, the, in the equity markets in particular, but also I know your audience is very much uh, interested in, in various commodity prices in terms of uh, what the future is going to look like in terms of future earnings in terms of companies or aggregate demand and supply conditions uh, for various commodities. And so the markets are providing great information, not only for investors, but for policymakers as they think through the response to the crisis, whether it's financial assistance or economic stimulus or those types of things. So. Uh, my first piece of advice is do whatever we can to keep the financial markets open. They seem to be working very well. The equity markets, you know, even though we had them hit the circuit breakers last week, uh, I think it was four times uh, on the downside. Um, I, I think that's actually evidence that the markets are working. We've seen no stresses in the in the infrastructure around the trading of that. Um, the futures market also is providing very good information for various commodities and interest rates. Um, we saw that there was a failure of one particularly small clearing firm. It had, had a particular bet on the VIX um, and, and they went down. But what we saw there was that the post uh, financial crisis reforms in terms of uh, members of clearing houses and, and taking care of their portfolios and winding them down and selling them off. That is all working very well. Um, we saw that the Federal Reserve has stepped in in the credit markets and the Federal Reserve is providing, along with Treasury, much needed liquidity in those markets whether it's the repo markets or the money markets, the commercial paper market, even in some cases, the corporate bond market, to keep those markets open and making sure that there's enough liquidity in those markets so that the prices that are produced um, from that are informative, like I say, for investors and for policymakers, and also allow people um, to, do, to, to liquidate their assets, to use it as a buying opportunity, and to maybe hedge some existing positions. Well, we both have dealt with a lot of brokers over the years. I would say having them work from home could be a major benefit for all of us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing how, I mean, you know, people were looking at, well, what does this mean in terms of, you know, people are going to be having to be working from home. Now, the Securities and Exchange Commission has done some, some relief um, for some of the trading firms and for some of the market makers in terms of some of the compliance issues they have to deal with, right? So normally... We think about some of the brokers and the, de the trading desks of uh, or the broker dealers, the large firms, you know, they have to record every conversation and the chats and, and all those sorts of things for confirmations for trades. And they've given some relief for the fact that people are working from home and trying to, to work through these issues. We saw that, you know, the New York Stock Exchange for the first time in its history has kept its market open at the same time closing the trading floor. And they went to fully electronic trading on Monday. They announced it last Wednesday. Uh, to give traders time. They did testing over the weekend. And by all accounts, um, trading has gone on um, uh, fine uh, in the markets. Um, you know, there's some volatility in the markets, but that seems to be the good volatility, the fundamental volatility, not the bad volatility, the transitory volatility. You've made some excellent points, uh, numerous ones, in fact. But, you know, the digital media market, for instance, the online trading, uh, the infrastructure for handling that yesterday, you actually hosted on behalf of your role uh, as the uh, executive director for the Milken Institute, uh, a debate with five former SEC commissioners that was hosted by Georgetown, correct? 
Well, it was actually five former SEC chief economists, um, and I was the one former commissioner who was there. And the reason why they wanted me is because it turns out I'm only the third PhD economist to be a commissioner at the Securities and Exchange Commission in the entire history of the agency. It's mostly lawyers, which makes sense because they're the ones who write the, 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 the security and enforce the securities regulations in accordance with the law. But, um, you know, I always found it, you know, my background in being an economist was very helpful to me in my role there. And you're right. We hosted a webinar. It was actually hosted by the Georgetown University Center for Financial Markets and Policy, where I'm a, a distinguished policy fellow. And uh, what we wanted to do was uh, have a public conversation about the importance of keeping the markets open. And so um, the title of the conference was um, Should Should Markets Be Closed? And there was an emphatic no um, uh, among all five of the, the former SEC chief economists and myself uh, for the reasons that I just described. Um, they, they provide particularly the equity markets and, and, the, and the bond markets, the capital markets in general provide liquidity. They also provide price discovery. And then two of the um, panelists were also former um, commissioners at the CFTC, and they talked about the importance of uh, leaving markets open so that people can manage their risk. Um, risk management strategies are important not only for financial institutions, um, but for end users who have to hedge their um, exposure um, to various commodities. And I know your audience is very interested in rare earth minerals and, and those types of things. And so keeping those markets open is very, very important, um, not only for the speculators in those markets, but also for the for the hedgers in those markets so um, that, that the producers, the end users can keep producing the products that you and I have to buy that now we have to get delivered to our house that we can't actually sometimes buy in, in the grocery stores. Okay, well, the bankers we're talking to say there's plenty of money out there and they're looking for places to put it. So because of your various roles, can you talk to us a little bit about the public, uh, public private integration of funds and, and some of the ideas that Milken Institute is currently dealing with to deal with this pandemic? Yeah, so we're doing some exciting work at the Milken Institute. So I run what's called the Center for Financial Markets and um, within the Institute. There's seven different centers. Um, some of them are health related and they're on the front lines of what's going on in the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. For example, our Faster Cures um, Center is working uh, very closely with um, a lot of the people who are developing the vaccines. And we actually have a vaccine tracker on our website where people can go there and, can, and see the various developments that are going on for, for the various firms that are working on not only vaccines, but also some of the therapeutic things that are involved with that. The Center for Financial Markets, what we, what we try to do is make sure that, um, that, that the markets work for people uh, who need them and when they need them, and that they provide access to capital, particularly for economically disadvantaged individuals, uh, but also throughout the economy. And you mentioned public-private partnerships. We had started on an initiative uh, even before the COVID-19 crisis that we call Resilient Infrastructure Financing. And what that, what that project is basically about is that we know that there's a great need in the United States to improve our infrastructure. And here in Washington, D.C., at the federal government level, it's almost become a joke where people say, oh, it's infrastructure week again, right? And, and the federal government can really never get its act together in terms of Congress and the president um, thinking through funding various infrastructure uh, initiatives. At the same time, there's many smaller projects um, that state and, and, and local municipalities uh, need to fund. And so before the crisis, we were thinking about things like wastewater treatment plants. And not only in terms of, of, of you know, redoing those or coming up with, uh, you know, and replacing those, but there's this notion of what we call resilient infrastructure. And so if you think of California, if you want, if California is going to invest in something, they're going to be really concerned on the front end now about making it resilient in terms of the next wildfire or the next earthquake. Or if you're in one of the coastal states thinking about, you know, the next hurricane or the next flood. And so there's a lot of uh, municipalities that are interested in doing some sort of uh, resilient infrastructure, whether it's replacing old systems like wastewater treatment plants that are 30, 40, 50 years old, very bad for the environment, use a lot of electricity with something that's more resilient. And then maybe even some newer projects like rolling out infrastructure for uh, 5G and the exciting developments that that's going to bring to us. And so those were things we were thinking of ahead of time. And so why are we involved at the Milken Institute? Well, these municipalities want to do it, but they're basically tapped out in terms of um, their resources. They can't fund it themselves in many cases. 
Um, you know, even if you have something like a wastewater treatment plant that's going to get um, funding over time from people paying their water bills or their sewer bills, um, they need upfront money and they're not able to tax people to get that upfront money. And so that's where the role of public private partnerships come in. And we have a number of sponsors and stakeholders that, that represent the investment community across the spectrum from the, the largest of the large ones. So think sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, um, down private equity funds, venture capital funds, uh, impact investors, um, philanthropy capital. And many of them are, are interested in doing impact investing or sustainability investing. And some are just interested in just you know, making a good return. And so we talk to them and we say, look, there's all these potential for public private partnerships out there. And they say, well, yeah, these individual projects are they're, they're too small. Maybe they're 20, 50 million dollars. But if we could get a portfolio of maybe 10 of those together and you're talking 200 to 500 million dollars, now it becomes very interesting. And so we embarked on an initiative where we were bringing we're bringing together state and local government officials on the one side who have these projects that need financed. And the and 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 the um, and the providers of that financing, and trying to figure out what the needs are and match those together, and see if we can come up with a concept for things like term sheets that can be replicable from one municipality to another, to to then make these public private private partnerships really work. And so we're just at the early stages of that. Um, we're going through. We're talking to the investors and saying, what do they need? We're talking to the state and local government officials and trying to teach them the language that investors speak because they don't typically do that. And we're gonna have a series of events. We had planned on doing a big rollout at our May Global Conference, which is our big uh, event that we, uh, our flagship event that we do every year. We have delayed that conference until July um, for obvious reasons. Um, and we're thinking about doing something virtually the first week in May that we're calling our you know, Resilient Infrastructure Week on that. So to the extent that, you know, your, your subscribers and listeners are interested in those public-private partnerships, uh, stay tuned on that. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to receive a lot of emails with, how do I get in contact <laughs> with regards to this program? So please do keep us updated. So speaking of resilience, though, uh, with your background, can you talk to us a little bit about how public companies right now should uh, – uh, be handling the regulatory disclosures. We're seeing a lot of confusion on that front. And the public companies, some are going under rocks. I mean, we're seeing some very interesting behavior. Do you have any advice? Because we do agree with you that we should keep the markets open. Any comments on that? Yes. The, the first comment is to the extent you have any questions, either you, the firm, or your outside counsel should call the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, I know that, you know, the, the, I, I sort of laugh at myself when I say, you know, when I tell people, you know, the first thing you do is call your regulator, right? That's the, usually the last thing people want to do. And I get that. We saw after the finance, you know, so there's always been a balance between the regulator and the regulated entity, whether it's a public company or, or think a broker dealer or that sort of thing. There's a balance between sort of confrontation and collaboration, right? Um, on the one hand, you want to collaborate with the industry. Um, because you get the, you, you can find out what are emerging issues and, and work with them. On the other hand, you have some bad actors and, and there's some, some confrontational issues. What we saw was that pendulum really swung after the financial crisis. Um, there was, you know, a, it, it swung to the confrontation side, right? Um, the joke was, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? And you saw all kinds of enforcement actions after the financial crisis. Um, that time has passed. Um, we have a new chairman in there, Jay Clayton. Um, we have a new um, uh, director of division of corporation finance, Bill Hinman, who are very much on the collaboration mode. And um, to the extent anybody has any questions about any of their filings in terms of deadlines or in terms of uh, getting relief, um, call the SEC and work with them. We saw if you look at the SEC's response and you can go to their website, sec.gov, and on there you can find um, they have a running list of all the different types of regulatory relief that they've given to regulated entities, whether it's public companies, whether it's um, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, broker dealers, exchanges, whatever it is, they've got a running list on there. Early on, the first people coming to the SEC, even before the, the COVID-19 hit our shores, were people that had either supply chains in China or um, had um, various operations in China that needed to be audited. And so they were worried about what happens if the if their outside auditors can't go in and provide the audits and give a, you know a, an unqualified opinion. 
And so the SEC put out some guidance on that. Um, it was the Division of Corporation Finance in conjunction with the, um, the Office of the Chief Accountant. And then, then people started coming to them, well, it's earnings season. Well, we need to put out our earnings statement, but we're, you know, we're really uncomfortable about providing earnings guidance. But the market may view that as a negative signal if we don't provide earnings guidance going forward. So can you give us some comfort? And so those discussions have been happening. And that's what I'm saying more of a collaboration mode that, this, that the SEC has had is, is having those discussions and working through those, those, those issues with issuers. And so to the extent that anybody has any unique situations that haven't already been addressed, contact the SEC, call them, email them. Um, they're, they're, they they want to work with people through this process as quick as possible. And if you've seen the recent statements by uh, Chairman Clayton uh, individually uh, on the website, he put out a statement about the importance of keeping the markets going, particularly for public companies. And the statement he recently did yesterday, I think it was at the Financial Stability Oversight Council meeting, uh, reiterating that um, it's something that they want to work with uh, issuers as much as possible. Well, I can't thank you enough, Michael, for joining us today. And I had several other questions, but I think what I'd really prefer is in lieu of your role in uh, the leading market making firm in New York or the New York Stock Exchange, if you have any advice out there for the public company CEOs, we have quite an audience of public company CEOs here at Investor Intel uh, that you can provide them during this time. Yeah, so it's important, right? So one of the things you know, I make that mistake often is when we talk about the importance of markets, you know, liquidity, prices, we think of it from an investor's perspective, but also from the from the public company's perspective, right? Why do they go public? Because they want that access to the capital. They need that to fund their operations, right? And then once they go public, why do they choose a particular exchange, NASDAQ or the NYC or the listing exchanges? And then if you choose the New York Stock Exchange, why do you choose a particular designated market maker? And you mentioned uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an advisor to uh, GTS, which is the largest designated market maker on the New York Stock Exchange. And they are they've been fully prepared to move electronically for a long time. Um, they fully believe in the NYSE's model, which is a, a combination of electronic trading plus human intervention and particular time. So, for example, when a company IPOs and they're building the book for the initial round of trading, um, that can take you know anywhere from 20 minutes um, to two and a half hours, I think, was the record for Alibaba um, to get that book ready to go, the order book ready to go to begin trading. And there's a lot of human intervention on that. Um, that now is taken into the electronic realm. GTS and the other designated market makers are fully prepared to do that. It may take longer to do things like that, but they can continue uh, to trade in this environment. It's important to note that even before this environment, both you know, if you think of the whole trading ecosystem, whether it's the New York Stock Exchange itself, the designated market makers, uh, GTS and the like, or the banks and the broker dealers who actually send the trades or even go further to the asset managers who send the trades to their brokers, they all as regulated entities have had what are called business continuity plans in place. And they always get updated when something new happens. So think September 11th, think Superstorm Sandy, think things like, um, you know, a blackout in, 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 um, in, in New York or, or the, you know, the northern part of the United States. And now um, they've been reviewing those in light of the sort of the public health um, systems that have been going. So far, so good, right? The, the business continuity plans seem to be working. Um, and, um, and, and the markets are, are, are generally working well. I know GTS, they're, they're working through the issue. A lot of trading is automated right now, uh, and you have human intervention, but you know, they're going to, they're just doing it from different locations and, and, you know, maybe some of the more manual things are a little bit slower to get done, but you know, that's to be expected. You know, it's like doing a lot, you know, like doing things like Skype interviews and, and those sorts of things, right? We can get it done. It's not as great if, as if we were there together in person, but you know, it works. Well, thank you again for your time, and uh, it's been a real pleasure. All right. Thank you very much. This was great.